Santa Barbara City uh, Ordinance Committee uh, to order. And um, Lori, why don't you call the roll and get us started? Chair Grant House. Here. Member Frank Hotchkiss. Here. Member Randy Rouse. Here. So, what do we have for us today here? The item before you today is Reach Codes Energy Efficiency Standards. Okay, very good. And um, and Mr. Estrella will be carrying us forward. Yes? How are you doing, George? Thank you very much. Uh, Chair House, uh, members of the Ordinance Committee my, Committee, my name is George Estrella. I'm the building official and manage the building division. On January 25th of this past year, uh, an energy efficiency ordinance was brought forth to the full city council to determine whether or not uh, council wanted to move forward with implementing uh, energy efficient ordinance that mandated uh, energy efficiency, primarily in the area of 15% more energy efficient than the current California energy codes for residential and approximately 10% more energy efficient for commercial buildings. After deliberation, council directed staff to come back uh, at, uh, sharpen our pencils, have some discussions, and see what uh, we as a city and community development might be able to bring forth in terms of incentives for, for the program, uh, uh, presumably at this point a uh, voluntary ordinance. Uh, so we went back and we had some discussions. Uh, and uh, as we were deliberating also and researching some of these, which also included contacting other jurisdictions of what they might be offering currently in terms of uh, incentives, uh, the Santa Barbara Contractors Built Green folks uh, sponsored a public uh, forum to discuss incentives uh, basically across the board for not only the REACH, proposed REACH code ordinance, but also for their Santa Barbara Built Green program. So there was uh, approximately 22 members of the public that showed up. There was much discussion. Uh, interesting enough, rather than focus on actual incentives, uh, the focus actually turned out uh, to concentrate on more process. Uh, what processes might uh, be changed or adjusted to uh, have projects uh, potentially run a little bit more smoothly through uh, our process. And so that uh, actually brings a, a broader discussion that's kind of uh, uh, difficult to share at this particular point in time. I say that because uh, yesterday, about 12.09 p.m., I received some, uh, some comments from the uh, Santa Barbara Built Green Program that they wanted to present to the Ordinance Committee. I don't know if they had done so, but um, uh, just to, to bring some of the, the items forward, uh, a lot of it centered on processing and being able to get through the process. Talked about a lot about solar and being able to process solar projects uh, a little bit more uh, quicker. They talked about, um, oh, uh, materials used in green buildings that uh, may not be listed or approved, but how can they be accorded in green projects? So really a lot of those comments kind of wasn't really central to incentives. What they did bring forth as a, as a recommendation or something to consider would be a reduced uh, plan checking fee for projects. Uh, their suggestion was, or a suggestion was, that you slightly increase fees for the rest of the permittees while reducing uh, fees for those who uh, qualify under um, the meeting uh, uh, the green, uh, the energy efficient ordinance or volunteer uh, ordinance. Uh, as the ordinance committee recalls, uh, currently in place, uh, we do have a, an incentive and that is a priority plan check. And that priority plan check extends to not only the Santa Barbara Built Green program, but it also includes uh, silver ratings for lead programs. So there's two volunteer programs already in place that we do support. 
and even in consideration of meeting the current California Green Building Code Tier 1, which is 15% more energy, we can also extend that incentive to uh, the applicants. So in hashing this around and contacting other jurisdictions and, and, and really looking at some potential viable incentives, we really weren't able to come up with anything that we felt was significant. Uh, if, uh, if the Ordinance Committee and Council feels that reducing fees is, is uh, some uh, a way to promote that, that's uh, definitely an item for consideration. We already do the expedited plan check. Uh, so we're kind of really limited to those items right now. Again, the other comments that were provided are more processed that it would involve more ongoing discussions uh, as we want to continue to see what we can do to process projects maybe a little bit more efficiently, maybe a little more promoting of projects maybe on our web page, <coughs> but uh, not really anything significant to be uh, able to bring to the Ordinance Committee, not anything that we that staff feels is viable at this at this time. Um, uh, there's a question, obviously, before City Council whether this should be a mandated ordinance or a voluntary ordinance or no ordinance at all. It would be staff's uh, uh, recommendation that this be this become a mandated ordinance. However, uh, it is also staff's recommendation for consideration is that if it's not a mandated ordinance, that it not also be a voluntary ordinance because we already support uh, two voluntary programs. We're very, we're, and so to have an additional voluntary program kind of, um, uh, it just kind of, uh, it just puts us a little bit more in a quagmire, I believe, in processing, and we really promote voluntary programs. If we're looking for a voluntary program, I would just simply direct and say, well, let's look at the Cal Green Tier 1, and those meeting that program, we can also take a look at uh, extending uh, an expedited plan check uh, to, to those applicants. Uh, at this point, that really does conclude my uh, comments and, of course, open for uh, questions. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Strayer, first, um, can you just uh, give a brief review over what the um um, what the REACH code um, effort is. Um, this has been yes. brought to us, I think, uh, major utilities and others have felt this is something of value and they've brought this forward and there's um, a list of specific things. Could you take a minute uh, right. with this, please? Well, just a brief history uh, is that this is really the current energy efficient uh, standards before you is really an extension of the Architecture 2030 program. Uh, which was embraced wholeheartedly by the community and council at that time and became effective in March of 2008. Uh, when the California Energy Commission adopted the newer energy code regulations, it basically came on parallel with uh, the ordinance at that time, which, uh, uh, which council agreed that it would sunset. So the ordinance before you is an extension of that. Some of the components of the ordinance um, are found on the section 22.82.030 applicability uh, and basically applies would apply to all new condition building or structures of any size any addition to an existing low-rise residential building or structure where the addition is greater than 500 square feet of condition floor area any addition to an existing non-residential high-rise residential or hotel motel building or structure where the addition is greater than 500 square feet of conditioned area. Also would apply to uh, circulating pumps for swimming pools, spas, and water features. And we did uh, also include uh, an exception, which is with non-residential remodels, primarily tenant improvements uh, or alterations that would be exempted uh, regardless of square footage, uh, unless it involved uh, changing out or affecting the HVAC systems, the building envelopes, uh, 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 electrical lighting systems, a little bit uh, more inclusive uh, of a full-blown tenant improvement. So minor changes, et cetera, to uh, tenant improvements, it would, would not uh, be affected. Um, and, and that's basically the bulk of what the ordinance is. And a 15 percent uh, above the um, the current um, California standards would be um, the same for each of those different 
um, categories? Sure, House, correct. Uh, uh, as it is in the ordinance right now, uh, residential uh, buildings would be 15 per percent more energy efficient than current Title 24 energy regulations, and for commercial buildings, uh, approximately 10 percent more energy efficient, with the caveats of the additions and the exceptions included. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there questions from the committee before we go to public comment? We have a, a few speakers here. Um, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Stray, when you talk about the 15% above whatever the baseline was before, and then, of course, California then caught up with it, um, I don't know, in, in turn, obviously, you can't have a 100% efficiency, I assume, but I don't, I don't know where we're, where we're dealing with in terms of a, a building's percentage of, of efficiency uh, when you build a building, uh, what determines the, and I know there's, there's formulas involved. Right. But what's the end game? I mean, we, we're going to, you know, California caught up with us. We're looking to leap forward again. Does that go on in perpetuity? I mean, what, 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 what's the scope of what we're dealing with here? Well, the scope is uh, not only to promote more energy efficient buildings, but to also take a look at the effects of buildings that are not energy efficient and the potential effects on the environment, such as carbon. Uh, in the, under the architecture 2030, it was to be carbon neutral by 2030. In some, in some buildings uh, under the current provisions, we're looking at uh, also the year uh, 20, uh, 2020, I believe. I think, I think that is. I could, be, I could be wrong on that. So what is the end game? The end game, uh, at least for reach codes, is to take the lead, to take the lead and be more energy e efficient which in taking the lead also means that there are uh, other incentive programs such as the Edison Company and Gas Company that promotes uh, reach codes uh, to that end. Uh, it's hard to determine exactly what the end game is because at some point in time, I think buildings will be energy efficient to the extent that hopefully we don't have to do any more adjustments. But uh, we do realize that uh, every three years or four years now, uh, the state definitely wants to take a look at the energy codes to see what they can do to uh, reduce carbon footprint, uh, gases. And, and when I say that holistically, it, it's just not energy. It's, it's byproducts, off-gassing, uh, that's also included in some of these uh, energy-efficient standards. So the end game is to have energy-efficient structures to the furthest extent possible. Well, I, you know, and I, I, I understand that is a broad concept, but, you know, the first increment of of change is is a lot easier than the subsequent increments of change as you get going on and clearly they'll they'll be either technology is going to have to step in or it's going to be get insanely expensive at some point to get to that last few increments of percentage change so I'm, just, I'm trying to get a you know a direction here where we're going I, I, uh, um. Councilman Morales, I, I don't believe I can give you the end result. Uh, it, it, obviously, uh, any ordinance that would come before the city council to be more energy efficient would have to stand its own merits and be weighed against, is this something that is reasonable to do? Is this something that uh, council wants to do as a form of promoting uh, energy efficient uh, construction? And it may be that we do get to, to a point in the future where we say uh, enough, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're satisfied where we're at. We don't need to go any further. But I can't answer that question sitting here right now as to when that will be, what year it will be, or the dynamics that will come about with change in, in terms of new technologies. It's very difficult uh, to, to uh, provide that uh, end result picture at this point. Okay. Mr. Hodges? Thank you. Um, the, process, the process discussion that you got into, which I think is a, important, that was not just for green building, that was for all buildings, is that correct? Uh, correct. Okay. I hope you can continue those, because uh, I think for the reason that morphed into that meeting is that they're so badly needed, at least the contractors, and I think I, my guess is architects feel that, and initially um, that was one of the things that I had set up, and I'm glad to hear this going forward. I know that you were the only guy there, but maybe next time zoning and others can be there too so that it's a broader discussion. So the, the intent is obviously to make um, access to uh, construction as smooth as possible and also work for, for you. I have a lot of other questions, but I'm going to wait until after the uh, public comment. Okay, very good. And uh, 
And Mr. Stray, it would be safe to say that this is this is one of those incremental kind of things. In other words, this is by little piece at a time, any new condition buildings or structures. So that's going to take a long time for like the whole city to turn over or something. And same thing for, it would have to be pretty significant um, additions uh, in some of these cases. And, as, and ex even with the exception, exception um, it, it, would, it, it means that it, it's going to take many, 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 many years to accomplish this goal. And, um, and I, don't, I don't know if I see an end in sight, actually. It could just go on and on, just being more and more efficient. All right, well, just checking. Um, we'll uh, start, we're gonna have uh, Gilberry come up and then followed by Paul Zink. Great. Yes, how are you doing? My name is Gilberry. I'm a local architect, and over the last 35 years, I've worked on over 300 projects, and a typical scenario this is both residential and commercial, and for additions and new buildings. A typical scenario is a client will come in, have a budget, let's say it's $300,000. And then the architect draws up all the plans with all the things that are needed, and you go out and get bids, and the bids are like $400,000. So then the, you have to work with the owner to figure out, well, how can we get the cost down, maybe get the cost down to three hundred fifty, and the owner raises another 50000 in the budget, and he you know, reluctantly goes ahead with the project. Now, to add another cost, even if it's $10,000, that means when an owner comes in with the $300,000 project, instead of the bids being $400, they are four ten. I mean, why in the world would we want to add more cost when right now we have a weak economy, people are struggling to do projects, the developers can't make the housing projects pencil out, why add more cost? People that are doing commercial buildings, you can't make it pencil out, you have negative cash flow. People don't just pay cash for these improvements, they get them with a loan with interest. And when the staff did the report last time, they didn't take into account the time value of money, didn't take into account the interest or the taxes, general contractors overhead and profit. There was a lot of things they didn't take into account. When you take those things into account, these, this ordinance is financially unfeasible. The cost to the homeowner or the commercial building or the rent might be $50 a month taking into account the interest, the savings might be $10 a month. It's not financially feasible. It makes no financial sense. So let's keep it on a voluntary basis. Save energy is a good thing. For those that can afford it and want to put in solar panels, great. You know, our architects love to make buildings energy efficient. But let's not force people to spend more money than they already don't have enough to do their project. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for your comment. Um, Mr. Zink, Paul Zink, uh, followed by uh, Daryl Deinhardt. My name is Paul Zink, and I'm an architect in town, and I do uh, residential remodels projects for all gamuts and also teardown rebuilds. Um, I'm against the mandatory nature of this ordinance because it is adding additional costs and additional burdens to the construction process. I want to bring your attention to the first sentence of the ordinance that says this modification to the California energy um, efficiency standards is required um, in this ordinance are necessary due to local climate conditions. I have a hard time believing in that statement. California has the Title 24. It breaks up the California into over 20 different zones. Whenever you pull a building permit from, this, from the building department, you have to do energy calculations. The energy calculations are based upon the size and the scope of the project. The bigger the project, the more things the California energy requirements dictate you to do. What we are saying in the city of Santa Barbara that due to our local climate conditions, we feel there should be additional energy efficiency put into the, that building. That additional energy efficiency is money, pure and simple. When I was here in January, I had one of my clients, one of my clients that I love a lot, but they had a tight budget and I had her write a letter from her perspective. Basically, we're talking money and people have a lot and some people don't and it's a choice. From my personal experience, I live in a 1960s two-story tract house. I remodeled my kitchen, I replaced some windows, and I added insulation. I did that on my own. The wall insulation and insulation in the attic cost me $1,200, okay? It was not required by the building code. It was not required by Title 24 for the scope of addition that I was doing. But I chose to do that above and beyond. It's going to take me years to justify how I'm going to save $1,200, but I did it because 
of what I wanted to do. Some homeowners wrestle with that problem. An extra $500, $800, $1,000, it all adds up. Thank you very much. And we'll go Daryl Reinhardt, uh, followed by uh, Karen Feeney. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, I was a professional estimator for electrical contracting firm for almost 10, 12 years. I've been involved with this energy program since 1966, when it was first instigated. Um, the word came up about incrementally, um, how this is where it's at. Um, you folks seem to be operating from the idea that you're, you're, on a, you're starting something really new here. You're starting something that really needs to happen. And what I want to, what I want to let you know is it's already happened. You need to study the incremental changes and the progress that this state program has done over the last 30, 40 years. You're already at an incremental stage. And what you're trying to do is change the world with this, and you don't need to. The state, state's requirements are far in, a, in excess of what they used to be, and they continue to be so. Um, these paybacks, that, uh, the study that you have, are not correct. They are not correct. They do not apply to the type of buildings that are being built in Santa Barbara. There are so many elements of those cost studies that are left out that do not substantiate the kind of payback you folks think you're going to get by doing this you don't have that many new buildings that's going to make that much of a change. Um, so I'm against this as being a mandatory. If you want to make it voluntary, fine. You're better off leaving it the way it is because anybody would have more bragging rights. You make it a requirement of 10 to 15 percent, somebody makes it 5 percent over, that doesn't give them near the bragging rights that if you leave it the way it is, they can say they beat the requirements by 15 or 20 percent. At your tea parties and different places that you go, you'll have a lot more chips on your shoulder than you will if you, you, you make this 10 or 15% mandatory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Karen Feeney will be followed by Dave Davis. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Karen Feeney with Allen Associates. Um, as Mr. Australia has said, we've been at this for some time. I've been a strong advocate of the Architecture 2030 program uh, helped to bring forward and supported the first reach code effort that we had a few years ago and now been an advocate for a mandatory reach code effort that would take us to the next level. At past meetings, uh, I've presented information about on the ground case studies of residential projects that we've been building in Santa Barbara. Talk to you about the energy efficiency improvements that we made in those buildings, the percent better than Title 24 that they achieved, and the costs associated with it. At the last meeting, I was asked by one of the city council members if we had a payback analysis of those projects. And at the time, I did not. But two months ago, we went down to the city of Carpinteria, and we had a public workshop on the REACH code possibly being adopted in that community. And I was able, as a result of your question, to prepare a payback analysis of the, that information that I presented to you previously. And I've handed out copies of that. And if you could stay with me just for a moment or two, I'd like you to walk you through it. If you look at the second page of the handout, um, I just summarized here some of the energy efficiency incentives that are out there right now for remodels. First of all, the State of California, through the Public Utilities Code, offers Energy Upgrade California. It's managed through, in our area, Southern California Edison. And what that does is for remodels, if you test your house before you do your remodel and you test your house after your remodel and you show that you've made a certain percentage improvement in the energy efficiency of your home, you get cash back up to $4,000 from the state of California. There's also a federal tax credit right now where uh, it's for, for remodels only and there's an incentive there up to $500. What we looked at is utility bill savings. If you go to ohm.com, which is a Microsoft uh, program, you can get the average utility costs in our community, which is about $1,500. With the energy efficiency improvements that we're talking about, you can achieve about an average, if you achieved an average uh, energy efficiency savings of 30%, that brings your bill down by $450. For new construction, a couple of the, the incentives that are there is one is the California. Excuse me, let me ask, why do you say 30 percent? Just it's 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 uh, it's achievable with the energy efficiency improvements that we've recommended and that are outlined in our case studies. But these energy efficiencies are not retrofitted to the rest of the house if it's an addition. Is that correct? 
It can be. It really depends. If you do an addition, it's an opportunity. Right, but the way it's asked right now, if it was mandatory, they wouldn't be required in the rest of the House, right? Well, the reality is, is in order to achieve um, Title 24 improvements, you can improve the rest of your house, and it actually helps you to comply better with the Title 24 requirements. Excuse me for interrupting. That's okay. That's fine. So with new construction, a similar program through Southern California Edison is the California Advanced Homes Partnership. For homes that are 15% better than Title 24, more efficient than Title 24, um, or, or more, you can receive an incentive up to $2,000. So they're giving a little bit more money for a remodel than they do for a new home. And then the utility bill savings are the same. You turn to the next page, you'll see some familiar information uh, showing you the projects that we've been uh, the case study projects that we were have presented at past meetings. And here, for example, the Schiffer residence, um, it, a, pro, a project that's received, or excuse me, exceeds Title 24 by 17 percent by incorporating a more energy efficiency, efficient furnace than t required by, t by Title 24, higher and better wall insulation than required by Title 24, and more efficient windows. We were showing you that there's a cost, additional cost, an incremental cost on the cost of that building of 77 cents a square foot. And why don't you go ahead and summarize your uh, final I will. points? I just so want to show you this one example because it uh, pertains to the others as well. Okay. Um, so if you look at the next page, which is the payback analysis, the cost of the energy efficiency measures for the Schiffer residence was about $1,800. Utility bill savings... Um, if we go back to the $1,500 and the 30% savings, about $450. The payback without any incentives is about four years. But if they had applied for the California Advanced Homes Incentive and received $2,000 back from the state of California, the net savings at the end of one year would have been $878. So uh, there's other examples here on other projects, but if we just go to the last page of my handout. All right, thank you. And then please wrap up. Yes. That... Without upfront incentives, the paybacks on these projects range from about three, do three years to six years in time. But in most cases, the incentives cover all or most of the upfront costs, reducing paybacks to zero. And that actually, residents have the opportunity to earn money in the first year after making these energy efficiency improvements. Okay. So I just want to say that it is something that is cost effective. Um, we've talked about hardships. We've talked about the extra cost, but that's not the reality um, based thank on you. our experience. So thank you, thank, very, thank much. you very much. Thank you. Um, Dave Davis will be followed by John Kelly. Hi. I'm Dave Davis. I'm representing the Community Environmental Council. I'm also representing the South County Energy Efficiency Partnership, which actually is the agency which brought forward to you the, the request for the REACH code. Um, <clears throat> two things. One, I want to start with thanking um, Councilmember Rouse and, and House for basically continuing this item for discussion. And I want to correct the record that the motion that the Council had was to explore potential incentives to include in the REACH Code ordinance, not instead of, not a voluntary ordinance, but incentives which would make the REACH Code even more palatable to the community. We had hoped to present a real full presentation of the incentives which might be out there, we don't believe that, that George and his staff have basically in, consulted the community adequately. The, the activities at the Bill Green Forum were wonderful. We participated. We support them wholeheartedly because we need a larger dialogue relative to processing uh, green building in this community. So we support the, the, the recommendations of Bill Green. But the REACH code was not the purpose of that meeting, nor were basically all the representatives from the gas company, Edison, the partnership, or CEC there to basically make that presentation. So one, I don't believe, and today, the people who brought you this, Edison and the gas company, could not make this meeting. I thought this meeting should have at least be continued until the time that they could be here. Karen presented part of that information, but in Carpinteria, we had a full-on workshop, which I, I think basically this actually would, would um, uh, w w you should consider. Going to Councilmember Rouse's question, the state has asked and set goals of zero net energy for residential by 2020 and 2030. There are buildings in this community today, residential homes in Goleta, that are zero net energy homes. They've done efficiency, they've done solar, they basically make them. And it, it is something the state is working on because in order to supply a healthy economy, we need a healthy energy re reg regime in the state. Excuse me, yes. Mr. Davis. So 
the state has said that, does that mean that it's part of Title 24 or it's just a, it's a goal outside of it? It's the state energy, uh, actually it's the adopted state energy plan. Title 24 is one of the action items, the implementation items. That's why it would be updated every three years. And the PUC and Energy Commission has asked communities such as Santa Barbara to show how it can be accomplished. We did that once before in, in LED, which has led to at least a, a large statewide um, uh, uh, activity to basically do the cheapest energy which is out there. Reduce through energy efficiency means we don't have to supply additional peaker or other uh, power plants out there that they could have other kind of consequences. So the state has asked communities such as Santa Barbara, be a leader, show how we can achieve those goals and make that happen. Our communities have been able to do that. I would disagree with the, the previous architects that in fact the majority of architects in this community see this as something that saves people money over time and is told to people who are into, in, into building new construction, look at the life cycle cost. In fact, with these incentives, in a, very period, in a very short period of time, you are making money, you are saving money. Those dollars, instead of being basically recirculate as consumer dollars here in this community. Well, Mr. D Mr. Davis, real quick, I'm, because we're going to be short on time, I wanted to ask oh, you a quick good. question here. Okay, it's good for the community. It saves money for the clients. We support the REACH code, but we really need to have a healthy debate about what incentives are out there, process-wise, uh, from the utilities in terms of their, the, the current programs and where those programs are going. So, one, I want to thank you for having the hearing. But I also want to continue this discussion so that we can bring all the necessary people into the room and have a, have a really good discussion. Okay, yes, yeah, sir. Stick, stick around for a second. Um, the, it is interesting that it talked about local climate conditions. I mean, I think the idea somehow was for local jurisdictions to craft their own in their own peculiar or particular way. And um, what, do you have any insight on that? Yes, I do. Uh, <clears throat> The building code provisions were not changed to allow George the flexibility not to make that finding. While well, the Energy Commission and the PUC and the state have adopted this goal, and they said you now can do reach codes, they didn't, the building, the, whatever that the, the, the code people are, they didn't change the code to say, in fact, if you're doing a reach code, you don't have to make that finding anymore. But what the state has said is go into each climate zone and develop standards adapted to that, that, that climate zone such that, in fact, you can reach these reach goals within a coastal climate as well as a desert climate as well as a mountain climate. So George has to make the finding. Basically, he's doing that in order to adopt the ordinance. Same problem we had back in 2007, 2008 when we adopted the previous code. And, in fact, those codes will change over time. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Davis? Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Kelly, John Kelly will be our last speaker. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I'm a local architect. My name is John Kelly. And so I'm going to address the kind of hands-on approach to this. First, I'm going to say that um, the uh, voluntary programs like Built Green that I've, I've used for my clients are great. The, um, any way that the city can support that, there's a bunch of recommendations that the Contractors Association and Built Green has sent. Um, as far as the REACH code, I'm in favor of it being mandatory as it was before. Uh, I believe this combination of the voluntary for a more comprehensive green building program and a mandatory for the energy efficiency is a great combination. This is a, if it's not, if it's not broken, don't fix it situation. I think we need to continue this program. And let me tell you why. Um, would this ordinance add cost or time to the permit process? No, there's no additional step needed because the applicant is already doing the energy calculation. The plan checker is already checking the calculation. The only thing that has to be read is, is there that compliance margin of 15% or more? What about hardship? There's no indications during the last phase of this program that there, anybody complained about hardships. Residential additions of 500 square feet or less are exempt. Many tenant improvements are exempt. And research indicates that if you try and separate out the additional cost, it's something like three-tenths of 1%. Now, I don't really look at that 
that I don't look at it as a separate cost. Some people have spoken here today as if it were a separate cost. When I work with a client on a project, I get their budget, I get their program, I look at their site and their preferences, and I put together the best possible building for them under the circumstances within their budget, and that includes energy performance. It's not a separate thing as far as I'm concerned. It's just part of a well-integrated design. And in terms of um, the outcomes, um, here's three recent projects. Uh, a, a T fire rebuild, new, new home, 52% um, better than Title 24. A T fire, re, another T fire rebuild that has an exceptional amount of glazing area, over 45% glass area because of views. 21% uh, better than Title 24. Uh, an addition remodel, uh, 40, almost 44% better than Title 24. This is not using some exotic technology. This is off-the-shelf off stuff. These are standard budgets. This is not anything that can't be done or is a hardship for anybody that's doing a larger addition, a whole house remodel, a new building. This is very doable. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. So, um, you know, this is really important because the buildings we build now can last indefinitely with proper maintenance. And so if we build them better now, that pays forward into the future. So Let's wrap up I things. really would uh, like to see you support the continuation of this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, that uh, ends the public um, hearing part or comment part of it. And... Um, uh, Mr. K uh, Mr. Estrella, um, from the things that you were just hearing, you heard a couple of different perspectives there. Um, does any of this have a, um, uh, a significant impact on staff resources um, one way or another? Um, uh, the, this being a mandatory program or, or maybe just not even being a program and, and going with uh, the, the things that we already have in existence, is there going to be an impact one way or another on staff? I believe so, uh, to a certain degree. First of all, if, if this ordinance were to become a mandatory program, then uh, the suggestion from staff would be that no incentives be offered, meaning the incentive that we have in place, at least right now, is a priority plan check because most of the projects, or uh, a great deal of them, would meet that criteria, and obviously we couldn't prioritize every project. Uh, so that would be a, an impact. Uh, there also, there's also potential impact if we look at a voluntary ordinance uh, to some degree also, because we already support uh, the uh, Santa Barbara Built Green Program as a voluntary, the LEED Program as a voluntary, and even consideration of meeting the current uh, Cal Green 15% as a voluntary program. So the question is, how many voluntary programs do we want to support supporting energy efficiency and green building? Uh, so it, it, it potentially could to a certain degree. And that's why it's staff's recommendation that from my perspective as the billing official, I much would rather see a, uh, uh, an ordinance in place across the board uh, that, uh, that supports the uh, uh, energy recommendations contained within the ordinance, uh, puts the uh, city of Santa Barbara uh, back on top of the lead versus a voluntary program that probably has some ad uh, additional work attached to it. For example, under a voluntary ordinance, uh, things that go above and beyond, we would also be plan checking those items too under the ordinance itself. Uh, versus the voluntary programs that we currently support, which is the LEED mm -hmm. and Green Building folks, and they pretty much take a look at the projects and verify compliance with all the elements that they uh, use to uh, qualify and quantify the project also. So, uh, I see. So, for the voluntary ordinance, would have a. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, yes, please. I, I just, Mr. Chair, I kind of want to make sure we answered your question as well. And Mr. Stray can correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Casey. There's not much staff involvement in plan checking a project that either has this as a mandatory ordinance or not. We're checking okay. the energy calculations. It's very simple to check whether they exceed Title 24 by 15 percent or whether they just meet the Title 24 requirements. So, so the mandatory was, ordinance, there's not really an impact on staff. <clears throat> As a voluntary ordinance, it could have some 
you know, our, our feeling, and I think if I could try to frame your decision-making process for you today, uh, our feeling is that a voluntary ordinance isn't really helpful uh, in the sense that if someone wants to exceed Title 24, they can do that on their own fruition. They can do that for any number of reasons, and we'd encourage them to do so and hope they would. And so we don't know what the benefit is of having a voluntary ordinance that says exceed Title 24 by 15 percent, what that gets you. And so we just kind of feel that's unnecessary and that really what we would like the City Council and the Ordinance Committee to decide is do you want to have an ordinance or not? And we think that's a pretty clear, simple discussion. What we thought the council direction back to ordinance committee was, was to consider if there were city incentives um, for either a voluntary or mandatory ordinance. And I think there's some confusion about what the direction of the council was. Is you know Was this supposed to be incentives with a mandatory ordinance or incentives with a voluntary ordinance? And so we want that direction from you as well. Our feeling is, is that we don't really have any meaningful incentives at the local level. Now, as Mr. Davis says, there may be a lot of financial incentives that are available from the utilities and that other stuff. And if that's helpful to the Ordinance Committee and to the Council to understand what those programs are, then yes, we can engage more in that process as well and bring that back to you if that's informative and helps you move along. You know, I'm trying to be efficient with staff resources, so I want to know if we're moving towards something rather than just go do something for doing something's sake. So if it's helpful to you and it helps you get to a decision, we'd be more than happy to go do that. But I think we need that direction from the Ordinance Committee and ultimately back to Council. Are we talking mandatory ordinance or not? And if so, you know, how do we want to go forward? just want to be sure I get it. So mandatory ordinance, no big, no big impact on staff resources um, voluntary kind of what's the benefit what's the point you know may not be necessary there's these other voluntary programs out there anyway right. and then the incentives not really meaningful incentives inside the city's structure however somehow participating in this kind of thing there seem to be considerable incentives or I mean there are real incentives out there that could shorten that return on investment time and, and if you want us to investigate that a little bit more and bring you back some better detailed information about what those programs are, we can do that if that's mm -hmm. helpful in your decision-making process. I see. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hodgkiss and then Mr. Ross. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, you can just nod from there, but when you did those high energy efficiencies you were talking about, there was no mandatory program in, in place. You did the, your client and you did those voluntarily. You can come up here, Mr. Kelly, if you want. Mr. Kelly, why don't you come on up? Let's get you on the record. and. Have people have a chance to hear you? Uh, I, I take care, uh, advantage of both the voluntary and mandatory. So, um, one but, of but them these was, these mandatory. Was, one of them was in the city. Right, those exist already. What you're referring to the exists ones already. To uh, two are completed, and one's under construction. Right, and but those, the the rules and regs that you did those under exist already. They're on the books. And you took advantages of uh, did you the take reach uh, the the previous version of the reach code applied to the the project that was in the city of right. Santa Barbara. Okay, so what I'm saying is we have great efficiencies that are on a voluntary basis right now, insofar as these these codes are concerned. That, that's yeah. what you've said. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, well, let's let him, let him answer there. The, uh, the the point of my bringing those up is that. Um, if I can do it, any of these guys can do it. And uh, we need to, to have a little, we've got a great uh, built green program that's uh, a voluntary incentive based program. And we've had this uh, energy efficiency reach code that's encouraged everybody to learn a little bit more, do a little bit better. That's, that's a stick. I think a small mandatory program like this totally makes sense because it brings up the level of practice throughout the city. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, and uh, the persuasive, Ms. Kelly, the, I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Feeney, I apologize. Your figures are also persuasive, but again, these are things that I think if you went to a client, if they're accurate, I assume they are, they would say yes, right? Come on up here, Ms. Feeney, that's great. Yeah, it's good that we're having a little to, dialogue here. I really to, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to agree with Mr. Kelly. Why not raise the bar for everyone and, and, and push this envelope higher? Over the last few months, I've seen a number of things that are happening in the world that make it more important than ever to have these kinds of things well, done on the local level. Let's go back to my question, which was you sold, these, you sold these independent of any mandatory requirement. Your client said, great. Okay, fine. That's right. Um, well, I'm sympathetic to costs. And you all are not end users. The guy that's building is the end user. In fact, 
to a degree, if the costs are more, if you work on a percentage basis, however small it might be, you actually make a little bit more money. But I don't think that that's persuasive one way or the other. I think that you're doing this because you really feel that it's important. However, I also feel that it's important that we give people a choice and that if they want to do what you say, which is convincing, they should be allowed that choice. Or if they cannot, for whatever reason, either for ideology or for pocket money, can't, that they also ought to be get, given that choice. Um, when, when the increments seem small, as little as 59 cents a square foot by previous submissions, uh, to two dollars and fifty seven cents per square foot, remember that those costs must be doubled over time with the customary mortgage um, and when payback uh, the other statistics that i 've seen didn 't didn't agree with yours, but that showed that uh, payback was 29 to 31 years for a single-family home. Nobody owns their home. Well, very few people own their home that long. So the people that are asked to pay for this would not realize any savings. Um, our general plan update says that we want to encourage businesses to come here in every way we can. If we make it, however small, a little bit more expensive for them, to me that's a discouragement and a contradiction. So we either have to take that out of our GPU or leave it in. I think we're going to leave it in. Um, uh, I think the when the use of the word reasonable which is a good one, which somebody used, and um, to me the reasonable choice is to allow people themselves to make this choice. Um, this is not, there, there's no CEQA application here because there's no real measurable effect from what we plan to do. And as uh, Mr. Howes pointed out, it, this will go on, for, it really has no immediate effect at all. It would go on forever and ever and ever until Three, three years from now, we tighten it up another 15% if we follow recent tradition. Um, now that's all I have to say. I'm just, you know, in a time like this, I don't want to increase people's costs, however incremental it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodgkiss. Uh, let me see if I can get an answer on a couple of these things. Uh, we, the analysis that we had last time, we had the expert that was here that had done an analysis. Um, and uh, we're... we're were we talking 29 and 39 year paybacks on these, or what was the return on investment on? It varied depending on the project, and uh, the person's name is Mr. Mike Gable, who did the Thank you. Uh, the cost effective analysis. Mm -hmm. And so it varied according to projects. So some of the projects we're seeing here for the kinds of improvements that would meet that 15 or exceed the 15 percent, those returns on investment are pretty short. I mean, there's actually a payback that's really in a very uh, just a few year period. Were there some projects that were very, very, there must be some that were very, very extensive that had a longer, had a more Obviously, extensive time. I'm sorry I didn't bring mine with me here today. Chair Grant, you are correct. And it really depends on the size of the project and whether you're talking residential, commercial. One thing I would add that Mr. Gable did uh, share with both the Ordinance Committee and uh, the Council was that he used very conservative numbers and figures. So he factored in a lot of these uh, paybacks that would appear to be longer on paper, but uh, in his his expertise actually would be uh, a lot quicker. But again, it is dependent on size of the project, be it residential or be it commercial. Okay, and a question for Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, is CEQA required when there's a, a positive effect, uh, or is it really the negative impacts that trigger CEQA? I mean, how does that work? We do some sort of a review even up front to make a determination whether further analysis is required. How does that work? Yeah, Mr. Chair, you know, we, we looked at the ordinance and, and did a, an environmental analysis and determined if there would be any environmental impact of the action that was pending before you. And so generally that is looking at a negative impact to the environment. We determined that there wouldn't be any uh, from this action that was before you. All right, thank you very it much. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that there is no beneficial impact of the action. It's a negative impact that triggers the, the secret right. review at the higher level. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rouse? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, actually, Ms. Feeney's presentation was kind of what we were kind of asking for before, exactly what was out there in terms of incentives and what could be out there for the, the end, end consumer. Um, and I'm, my overall impression right now is I'm, I'm very much struck by the fact that that somebody would be a fool not to do these things, and so I'm kind of wondering about the you know, why we why that obviates the need for an ordinance or for a, for the for the sticks to come out along with the carrots. Seems like there's carrots outweighing the sticks within your presentation. When I met with uh, Mr. Davis before the last presentation in front of council and the CEC folks, and we talked about this stuff, I was 
I had the same impression I have right now as today. And then when we discussed the amortization uh, times, that's when you know the, the, the sirens went off for me because they were, as Mr. Hoskins pointed out, talking about 20, 26, 30 years in some of these improvements. Uh, not all improvements, but some you know, for the paybacks. Um, which brings me to a point that Mr. Davis brought up that I really like, because there's a few things going on right now that really need uh, community dialogue and participation, and we need the expertise of the CEC, of Edison, of the CAS company. Uh, I'm talking about all the stuff we're talking, because the numbers that come out are oftentimes conflicting. And uh, I know that when I, when I went to Earth Day, for example, because one of the plans is to, to have these charging stations. I asked three different purveyors on their cars, you know, how many kilowatt hours it took to get to a full charge. I mean, nobody can answer the question. Well, it's cheaper than gas. Well, great. But how many? I need to know what my end use is going to be at home. When I plug it into my 110, what's my bill going to look like at the end of the month? I need to calculate, well, it'll be cheaper than gas. You know, and I got that three different times from three different people. My point is this, maybe cheaper than gas, I don't know, but I think the information needs to be brought together in a comprehensive way. I think we're jumping the gun even going to the ordinance right now, frankly. I would like to follow Mr. Davis's suggestion, get all the players in the room, like apparently you did in carpentry, is that correct? And answers, and you know, even have Edison, you know, present on the smart meter concept, which yeah, you know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of rumors going on right now. I think we need a community dialogue about all of the above prior to trying to mandate something or to give Mr. Wiley something else to do in the ordinance writing department or whatever it is, I believe we're jumping the gun. I would like to have some of these, these, these questions answered in a comprehensive way and not just by one side of the ideological aisle. I'd like to have all the players there, the skeptics there, the proponents there, and hammer this out before we go forward and make a bunch of assumptions because to me, I'm getting conflicting bits of information. I'm not, I'm not comfortable moving forward with anything at this point in time until we get all the information. So okay. um, I don't know if that can work into Thank a motion you. or not, Mr. Chair. But, well, you can, uh, you're sure welcome to try. You know, I, I want to say um, I appreciate this, inf this request for more information. What I was hopeful for, and I understand staff, staff being a little tentative about, you know, bringing on the whole, whole conversation, but we're going outside of what the city's incentives, and I appreciate this analysis, that it really isn't all that meaningful for us to try to incentivize internally. On the other hand, for us to move forward, we really would want to move forward with a sense of confidence that we're doing something good for the public at large. And one of the things that is, of course, a benefit, if this is of value, is that it does apply and sort of level the playing field. I mean, there's, there's people that would, you know, that, that literally wouldn't participate, and not necessarily for all the most wonderful reasons. I mean, we really want to make sure that there's a chance for uh, people who want to do well to be able to compete well. As, so having a level playing field is pretty important. I would love for us to take this. I know we can't do the whole energy thing, but if we could stay somewhat focused in this area of energy efficiency, I would be very, very happy for us to move this to a place where, and even use, and use the Ordinance Committee and this Chambers right here as a place to have a good dialogue and carry this forward. And so if there were a motion to continue this for that exact purpose, I would uh, support it. Um, and uh, I'm looking for that first. Yes, Mr. Ross? And I'll give we'll it. go to Mr. Hotchkiss. Just okay. To, uh, actually, if Mr. Hodgkiss has a comment, I'll let oh, him yeah, go, go ahead, first. please. Mr. No, I actually wanted to to, to um, propose something here, mm. which is until such information is available that we have no ordinance, voluntary or otherwise, and send it back to City Council that way. Okay. Any second? So, all right. So that motion dies for lack of a second. We have another motion, possibly. Let me, let me get, take a run at this. Might be moving in your direction anyway, Mr. Hodgkiss, to get us some more information. Not as not necessarily as part of the motion right now, but I would like to, 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 to direct staff to continue the informational part of this campaign to potential uh, builders and developers. I think that's really valuable. And I, once again, from the stuff that Ms. Meany and, and others brought forward, uh, it seemed like there's the, the incentives are there. It would it, it'd be crazy for people not to make that choice. But I would also like to um, make a motion that we uh, coordinate, uh, perhaps in these chambers at a future ordinance committee meeting, the type of outreach informational program. Uh, we may have to schedule a different time. I'm not sure, but um, outreach informational program involving uh, the CEC, the utility companies, 
architects groups, um, and hopefully some development types. Yes, and then Bill Green folks, and have a uh, comprehensive informational dialogue on all subjects pertaining to um, utilities such as power and and uh, and, and uh, electricity and gas, and uh, and not limited just to that, but also on the, the smart meter issue as well. So. Okay, um, I'm going to second that for purposes of discussion and ask Mr. Uh, Casey if you would help us with this a little bit. And, and Mr. Stray, you could help us just a little bit because I think that somehow we've got to make sure the scope is manageable. On the other hand, I really appreciate the interest. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. what I'm hearing is that A, CEC has done something very much like this already in Carpinteria. So we'd like to piggyback off that effort and okay. you know use the information and the resources and contacts they have already in place. What I'm hearing, though, is that the ordinance committee would like to be part of that workshop and so we can agendize it as an ordinance committee meeting so all three of you can be there it doesn't have to be in this chamber we can maybe pick a different room but we can plan on agendizing it as a meeting of the ordinance committee so your full attendance can be appropriately there but we can still keep it somewhat informal and informative and work session like Okay, very good. Mr. Stray, did you have some input on that as well? I know we're focusing on reach code today, but this is a little bit of a broadening of the scope. Uh, then again, um, Ordinance Committee would be um, agendized and we would be there under Brown Act and we'd have a chance to um, um, be, par be part of the, the conversation. Um, and, Lori, do you have an idea about what that motion is? You're going to have to watch the tape. <laughs> you think you got it? Okay. so. All right, so let's just go ahead. Mr. Hodgkiss, you wanted to make a comment. Right, I want to be sure that we have both proponents and opponents. Publicly noticed, there. fully publicly noticed. Because the, the, the parties named were all proponents, and uh, there are negative aspects to this, and we should bring those out also, and as Mr. have some of the architects. Mr. Chair, we, we yes, fully Mr. intend and expect to have this be a, an open notice meeting work session format. Uh, I just want to build off what CEC's already done in putting a work session like this together with their contacts and such. But certainly we will notice it broadly and everyone is invited to participate. The other thing I would say is that if I could um, slightly alter your suggested uh, move motion here is that throwing smart meters in the mix is going to make it too much of a salad. And I would do that at another time and I think uh, SCE in fact is planning to do that already. Yeah, I don't need to specify smart meters per se, but I would like to have the SE reps there. Yeah, sure. Uh, if it's Mr. Conklin or who it's ever going to be, so we can get some comprehensive information and get some answers that uh, him. So I'll uh, stipulate here. Thank you. And just, okay. to, and just to clarify, yes, we're talking energy efficiency and incentives and programs tied around that. Yes. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and Mr. Hodgkiss, and I think perhaps for some reassurance, uh, that means there's no ordinance coming out of this committee until we've had that happen. So I think that we'll have a chance to speak to the ordinance after there's been that workshop. Okay, any other discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all for coming. We're now adjourned. <laughs>